Hello and welcome back to She Walks, She Paints. Thank you for joining me again on another episode. And if you have been liking, commenting or subscribing to my videos, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. And it's really helping me with my channel. Today we've come to a beautiful woodland. We're near Inverness and we've come to a place called Culloden. That might be a familiar name to a few of you. It's a very famous name in Scotland uh, because of the Culloden Moor and the battle that took place there in 1746. So it's a really momentous part of Scottish history. It's really famous, um, not just because of the Jacobite rise, but also because of the Outlander story and the connection there as well. So yep, we're gonna go visit. It's my first time going to the battlefield, so I'm really excited to see it, but it'll also be quite a sobering time as well because there was lots of lives lost at that battle and it's quite a sad part of Scottish history. So we're gonna go there, we're gonna find out about the history of the Jacobite Risings and we're gonna go on a bit further to visit the Claver Cairns, which is a mysterious stone circle. So a completely different part of history, but it also has an Outlander connection. It's a little bit breezy today, so apologies if any of the sound is affected or I have to use more music than usual but otherwise it's lovely we're in this beautiful woodland so let's head off and see what we can find
St Mary's Well, also known as the Well of the Wood in Gaelic, is a clutie well, a sacred natural spring. In Scots, a clutie is a rag or strip of cloth. Clutie wells are traditionally places of pilgrimage, where a healing ritual takes place by dipping a rag in the water and tying it to a nearby tree. It's likely that this practice goes back to pre-Christian times, calling on the nature spirit which was said to inhabit the water. This well was traditionally visited on the fierce Sunday in May, possibly linked to the Gallic May Day festival Beltane, celebrating the beginning of summer.
the 16th of April 1746, the Battle of Culloden took place here, bringing to a brutal end the final Jacobite Rising. 58 years earlier, the Catholic King James of the House Stuart was forced into exile by his government in favour of his Protestant daughter Mary and her husband William of Orange. The Jacobite movement supported the cause of the exiled king, and later his grandson, Charles Edward Stuart, better known as Bonnie Prince Charlie. These blue flags mark the front line of the Jacobite forces. The regiments would have stood here, facing the government troops, waiting for the order for battle to begin. It's hard to picture on a sunny, dry day like today, but this moorland was wet, marshy, and incredibly difficult to fight on. It favoured the government troops, who were well rested and had greater numbers than the Jacobites. The battle only lasted an hour, and the Jacobites suffered a brutal and bloody defeat. This cottage is a traditional dwelling, dating back to the early 1700s, which means that it was present at the time of the battle. Situated between government lines, it's likely that it was used as a field hospital for government men. Since the battle, the cottage has been occupied intermittently. The last occupant was Belle MacDonald, who lived here until her death in 1912. Her family gave tours of the battlefield to Victorian tourists. Around 300 government soldiers were killed or wounded during the battle, compared to around 1,500 to 2,000 Jacobites. here mark the burial places of the Jacobite army, divided into the clan names that they fought under. Many of the fallen were unable to be identified, and their resting place is marked by this stone. the rising was ended, penalties were introduced to undermine the traditional Scottish clan system and the wearing of tartan was outlawed, a repression of the Highland culture which lasted for many years. Bonnie Prince Charlie survived the battle, escaping the £30,000 bounty on his head to reach the Scottish Isles and eventually making his way to France. He never returned to Scotland.
So we've just left the battlefield site. It's a pretty amazing experience. It's really hard to put into words sort of what you feel there because what you see today is such a beautiful space. It's just open moorland and the National Trust are trying to put it back to how it would have been with the heather and the wildflowers. And especially on a day like today, it's so sunny and bright and sort of full of hope and the joys of summer and all the flowers. Um, but yeah, it's got this really awful, awful history that happened there. It's a really fitting memorial, I think, to have that space open. Anyone can visit. You don't have to pay to get in or anything, but you just walk around. I wanted to capture footage for you guys to see what was there, but I also wanted to be really respectful of the other people visiting and the history of the place. So I hope you enjoyed that snapshot and were able to appreciate the things that we saw today. We're going to head along a track now which is on the road, so I'll let you skip that bit and I'll catch up with you at the next location that we are going to see. So I'll see you there. Hiya. Hi puppy dog. Hiya, did you come to find me? Come on then, let's go. So welcome back to this walk. You've joined me again at the site called Clever Cairns, which is really close to Culloden. Um, you can definitely do both of them in the same day. And it's a really popular site for Outlander fans, especially because it has the accolade of being the inspiration for the stone circle where Claire gets transported back in time. We're very close to Inverness here, which is where the book and the show starts the opening scenes. It was also used as a filming location for the stone circle in the show, which of course isn't a real place, but it's based on what you find here. Other than that, it's a really amazing historical place to visit. You've got burial chambers and standing stones, which are about 4,000 years old, which is just incredible. Such an amazing site. We'll have a look around and I'll show you what there is to see. The Clever Cairns are about 4,000 years old and were built to house the dead. It remained a sacred place in the landscape for thousands of years. These cut markings are a type of prehistoric art found across Europe. It's likely that they predate the construction of the cairns and may show that the people who built these tombs reused stones from earlier sacred sites. The passageway of this chamber aligns almost exactly with the setting midwinter sun, suggesting that this was a significant time of year for the people who built it, a turning point towards the regrowth of spring. In 
1882, this became one of the first historical sites to be protected by law in the UK. Until this time, it was common practice for visitors to places like this and Stonehenge in the south of England to undertake their own excavations or take home a bit of the rock as a souvenir. Only one or maybe two people would have been buried in each cairn, and it would have taken a large number of people to build them, indicating that these may have been the resting places for very important individuals. Next to the main site is this mysterious, isolated standing stone. Maybe this means that the original burial site was far larger. Whatever the reason, these stones always have an incredible presence in the landscape, something just out of reach of our understanding. So there you have it. We've had a really brilliant day, really beautiful weather and just some amazing experiences as well. So went to the battlefield first and we did that beautiful walk through the woodland. You can park at the battlefield site, so you can just park there and walk around the site. Um, but for us, obviously, clues in the name, she walks, she paints. It was a really nice way to get there and back. I think it was about six miles through the woods to the battlefield and, and back again. So it's not for everyone, but it was just a really nice way to experience it for us. And then we visited the Claver Cairns, which was just amazing. That's so much history there. If you think about it, those brocks that we saw in um, Glen Elg and also in Betty Hill, they're 2000 years old so the stone circles and the cairns that we saw today predate those by 2,000 years so the time scales we're talking about are just mind-boggling it's absolutely insane and um, but that's what I love I love seeing that and just thinking about the people who put all the work into putting up those huge stones and building those cairns with such care and such precision even today that's really impressive so for them to be doing that 4,000 years ago is just amazing to me so yeah I love that kind of history I love exploring those places and I really hope you did too that's it for today I'm gonna head back now I will see you in the studio and I'll have a think about what I'm gonna paint from today. I only recently learned that there are many different types of thistle, and at least 10 are native to the UK. The most common ones in Scotland are the marsh thistle, the spear thistle, and the creeping thistle, which is the one I have chosen to paint today. I 
didn't want to sketch out the petals in too much detail, as the pencil marks would spoil the pale, pinky lilac shade of the paint. are quite repetitive to paint, building up the colour gradually, adding in a little bit more shading each time to make it look three-dimensional. thistle gets its name from the way it spreads over its habitat. In farming and gardening terms, it is considered a weed that needs to be controlled. But I like the association with the Culloden Moor, as it represents how nature is taking back the land after its turbulent history. I wanted this piece to be slightly more muted in colour than some of my other work, delicate like the flower head of the thistle, protected by its spiky leaves. While it is found across the world, the thistle is the national flower and symbol of Scotland. Legend says that during a nighttime attack from a Norse army, an invader trod on a thistle plant, and his howl of pain woke the defending Scots in time to retaliate.
people have been asking how long it takes to do my paintings, and while it varies from piece to piece, it is usually between 10 to 12 hours of work each week. This piece took about 14 hours start to finish. All my paintings are available as prints on my Etsy store. Purchasing a print means that you're helping to support my channel and genuinely helps me keep doing what I love and sharing that with you. You can also support me by liking, commenting or subscribing, following me on Instagram or by donating the cost of a coffee over on Ko-fi. Links to all my pages are in the video description below. It's a little bit windy today. I'm filming. <laughs> Ow! Jimmy! She's coming soon, Pops, don't worry, she's just doing something to camera. She'll be here in a minute. We'll just wait for her here. No, Jack, 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 Jack. Oh, oh well. Jack will be in the outro then. <laughs>